Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. How many of you have just decided I'm going to come into his gates with thanksgiving? I'm going to enter his courts with praise. I'm going to lift him high, and I'm going to bless his name. How about you? Did you come with the praise on your lips on this Wednesday night? How many of you can say, God has been good to me? Amen. He's been faithful. And I've got good news. He's always faithful. He's always good. I want you to just shout it out real loud. God is good. God is faithful. God will always be good. And he will always be faithful. Amen. Um, we're going to pray. But before we do, I just want to encourage you. And really, there's no greater way to bring encouragement to a person than to read the Word of God to them. Because the Word of God is living. Amen? And it lights our pathway. If we can ever get the revelation that it's not just about coming to church and hearing a pastor share Scripture, but I can choose to get in the Word every single day I can choose to allow the Word of God to be a lamp unto my feet, the Scripture says, and a light unto my pathway. So when we've got the Word in us, when we are students of the Word of God, it lights our way. It gives us direction. Amen. It makes things easier. And I think we just make it hard on ourselves when we try to do this minus the Word. You will never be victorious if you're not a student of the Word of God. Amen. Uh, Matthew, and this is just to build your faith. I want to share with you something Jesus said. In Matthew 18, beginning in verse 18, he said, Assuredly, so you can rest assured, is what he's saying. You can rest assured, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We've got to, and you know what? A lot of people, they know what this scripture says, but they are intimidated when it comes to binding and loosing because they don't know who they are in Christ. We've got to remember that Romans 8 says that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells inside my mortal being. So we've got power, and God wants us to use it. Amen? I want you to say it out loud. I choose to walk in power. The power that Jesus died and rose again to give me, I'm going to walk in it. He goes on to say in verse 19, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree, how many of us are in agreement tonight for the will of God to be done in this house? If two or more of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, what are you asking God for? Get a couple of faith people to get in agreement with you. Amen? He said, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And we come together in his name. We come lifting up his name tonight. Amen. So are you in agreement with me that these prayer requests that I'm about to share, we're going to believe God for them. And when you're praying and when you're in faith and standing in agreement, and we talk about somebody that's going through chemo that needs healing in their body, just imagine your spouse going through that. Let it touch home with you so that we can have compassion. A lot of times, if it's not happening to me and mine, I can say, Lord, bless them. Lord, touch them. But when it's me and when it's mine, I can intercede. I can wail before the Lord. Amen? So I want us to just believe God as though these were people in our immediate family. One more scripture, Romans 4, verse 20. It says, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. 
He chose not to waver. He believed God. And it says he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced, and that is the key. Do I pray it and wonder if God's going to respond? Or am I fully convinced that what he, the Lord, had promised, he, the Lord, was also able to perform? What God has promised, he is able to perform it. Amen? Praise God. Somebody just shout hallelujah. Somebody shout, I received the word tonight. Say it one more time. I received that word. And I choose to stand in faith tonight, not only for my need, but for my brothers and my sisters. Amen. Amen. Uh, first and foremost, we want to remember and pray for Israel. We want to pray for America. We want to pray for every innocent person that is called up in all of that stuff that is going on over there in that other country and you know war is an ugly thing and innocent people get hurt and what we've got to do is stand in the gap and just pray and believe and trust God for resolve amen that his mighty hand I have I've been praying this and sometimes when I pray it I feel like I almost see it in my spirit God, just let them see your mighty hand. Let them see your mighty hand move. Even those that don't believe in you, those that curse you, let them see your mighty hand in all of that that's going on over there. Uh, I want us to pray for Stephen Kendall's wife, uh, Angel. She's in the hospital. She's recovering from a broken hip. She was already there for something else, and she fell in the bathroom of the hospital, I think, on the day that she was supposed to be released and broke her hip. So please, let's remember Angel in our prayers tonight. Sister Byers, uh, she needs healing for her heart. Um, Sister Byers is faithful. Right there in the back greeting. I love you. That woman is such an encouragement to me. Uh, she has an issue with AFib. And how many of you know that God is bigger than AFib? Amen. So, Sister Byers, we touch and agree tonight. And we believe God to quicken your body and to heal you in Jesus' name. We believe for her healing. <clears throat> we declare it because he's already paid the price for it. Amen. Brenda and Ralph Alexander, for those of you that don't know Brenda and Ralph, they come in and they sit about midway over here on the end. And they're a quiet couple, but just love God with all of their heart. Um, Brenda needs healing for her shoulders. And Ralph needs prayer for his out-of-town travel uh, with his work. And God knows that need, so let's lift them up. Uh, Jesse and Logan, both of my kids have been battling some uh, respiratory problems, also some stomach issues. Uh, it's even more difficult for Jessie with the pregnancy. Uh, she spent night before last in the ER up until midnight. Um, they put, gave her a drip because she was totally dehydrated. Um, they found, I think, a spot on her right lung um, and it was, that was the cause of all of the coughing that she had been doing. It could possibly be RSV, not sure, but they took pictures of the baby. The baby is almost five pounds already and healthy, so we thank God for that. Today, Logan and Jesse are both feeling better, and so I believe God has already answered our prayers, and they are on the men's. Uh, Keith Whipple. <clears throat> Uh, is back in Oxford Hospital with pneumonia. We lift Keith up tonight. Uh, Dennis, which is Barb's neighbor, uh, is in the Veterans Hospital in Jackson, and they are treating him for embolism. Uh, so we lift Dennis up tonight. Barb will be having shots in her eyes on Friday, and she asks that we remember her in prayer. Uh, the Bowles family, please remember them. Their mother passed away, so we want to lift that family up. 
uh, Ryan Pachillo uh, is in the hospital in Jackson. And this is a very detailed prayer request, but his mother asked for this, so I'm going to share it. Uh, he needs deliverance from demonic spirits, and he needs a willingness to let all demonic entities leave his body. And we are in faith and agreement, and we declare his deliverance right now in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you know exactly where Ryan is. You know the room number. You know the thoughts that are going through his mind right this minute. And Father, I thank you that there is no demon greater than you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that at your word, demons have to flee. And we call him delivered. We speak to those demons and we tell them they must go. They have no right to Ryan Pachillo. And we declare him delivered right now in the authority of Jesus' name. We call him delivered in Jesus' name. Somebody shout out loud, in Jesus' name. We call it done. Say it one more time, in Jesus' name. We call it done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Kathy needs a miracle. Uh, F-E-R-R-A-R-I. -R -R Ferrari. Just like the car. She needs a miracle. She's been moved to a long-term critical care hospital. So please pray. Uh, and they're praying that her trach could be removed uh, within a week. So uh, God knows Kathy's needs, and we lift her up right now and believe you, Lord, that she is well and that she is whole in Jesus' mighty name. Ben Rogers, he has begun to laugh in a soft way. So we thank God for the progress with Ben Rogers. Uh, Linda Lehman, this is Regina uh, Ballard's mother. She needs God's wisdom and direction for her relationships. Uh, Maria, age 25, with three children, is undergoing chemo and radiation. We lift her up, Lord. I ask you to touch Maria, and I declare her healing, that you have already paid the price that she could receive and walk in. And Lord, I pray for her children. I pray for the entire family. And we believe you for a turnaround in this family and in her body in the mighty name of Jesus. James Ballard needs to be calm and peaceful toward nurses and residents. Uh, he is in uh, an assisted care facility. And so we're asking God to touch him and minister to him. Tanya Livingston, uh, she's pregnant with twins, and they have said that she has to stay in the Jackson Hospital until the babies are born. Um, please pray for all of them, everyone involved in that, of, co of course her and the babies, but extended family, everybody involved, we lift them up. Harvey Byers, this is uh, Sister Byers' son, needs healing for physical and financial breakthrough. Father, I thank you for touching Harvey right where he is right now. God, we declare every need supplied in Harvey's life, and we speak healing to his body in Jesus' mighty name. Chelsea Browning needs healing for depression. How many of you have ever been attacked with depression? You can relate to that. Father, we thank you that depression has got to go. And we thank you that your joy and your peace flood Chelsea's heart. In the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, Vivian Hathcock, please pray for a miracle. She has an advanced, inoperable brain tumor. I read these sometimes, <clears throat> Beverly, and I get convicted that I would complain about anything. If I'm healthy enough to stand up here and lead praise and worship, 
If I was able to get up this morning and get myself dressed and make me some coffee and clean up my house and do everything that I needed to do today, God forbid that I would complain when people are with serious major needs are really going through things. Sometimes I think we've just got to check ourselves. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, just check yourself tonight. Martha, Gail's cousin, is in hospice with lung cancer and in a lot of pain. So we pray for Martha right now. And we pray that this pain must go. And we call cancer the lie that it is, that it could remain in her body. It must go. We speak healing to her lung. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, I thank you that you're doing a supernatural work. And I correct myself, you've already done the work. But I thank you that you are going to give Martha the courage to receive the finished work that you have already done. In Jesus' mighty name. Tony and Carol Bradley, relatives of Pete and Donna, they need healing. Tony has dementia. Carol has Parkinson's. And we curse both of those diseases. We send them back to hell where they came from. And we say they have no right in Tony's body. They have no right in Carol's body. And we call them well. And we call them whole in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to take just a couple of minutes. And I want you to just thank him. Thank him for his goodness in your life. Talk to him. Talk to him just like I'm talking to you right now. Lord, we bless you tonight. We come before you with praise in our heart, with thanksgiving in our mouth. We thank you, Lord, for making a way for us where there seems to be no way. Thank you for working things to our good. Those that love you and are called according to your purpose, we have, we have a word on it that you're working things for our good. And we give you praise for that. Thank you, Lord, that every need that is represented in this house, every need, be supplied in the mighty name of Jesus. Lift up your hand. That represents your need. I want you to lift up your other hand, and that represents surrender. God, I give to you. I surrender it to you right now. It's no longer my need because I cast it on you because you care for me. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Do you feel the presence of God in this place? I feel his presence in this place. Lord, I thank you for healing physically, emotionally, spiritually, every healing that needs to take place in this house. God, I thank you that people are receiving it in Jesus' mighty name. We pray for household salvation. We call our lost family members into the kingdom of God. We declare that our children will serve the Lord. We declare that our grandchildren will serve you all the days of their life. Somebody needs to open up your mouth and declare it over your children and over your grandchildren. Devil, you can't have my family. They belong to God. We pray for our church tonight. We pray for our church family tonight. We pray for a harvest of souls to come into Way of Life Ministries in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Rob, I want you to begin to just walk. Rosalie, I want you to get, begin to just walk. Walk and touch every chair. Brother Pete, just begin to walk and touch every chair. We call every chair filled. Anybody else, I may not have called your name, but some of you feel the urgency to just touch chairs and declare them filled in the mighty name of Jesus. We call this house full. We claim them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. We thank you for a harvest of souls that are coming into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Every need of every person that is watching online tonight, God, I thank you that you meet them where they are, that you reveal your goodness to them, reveal yourself to them. And we pray that your will be done in this house tonight. We pray that your will be done in us tonight. 
And God, I ask you to give us the courage. I want you to say it out loud. God, give me the courage to walk out my purpose that you have for me in this life. Help me not to miss it, God. I want to walk out my purpose. The reason you have me here, give me the courage to walk it out in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And somebody shout out loud, amen. 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 And so be it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Are you ready for some praise and some worship tonight? I want you to just open up your spirit and allow God to have his way in you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He is so great. Enter into a place of worship and give God everything of you tonight. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you give love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. You Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we Your breath in 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we worship you. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord, more than we could ever express. We need you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need you, Lord. How many of you can say, I need you, Lord? Every day. 
every day. Thank you, praise team. I want you to let the praise team know how much you love and appreciate them. They're so faithful to lead us into the presence of the Lord, and I appreciate them. You know what? God sees faithfulness, and God sees unfaithfulness. Amen. With that being said, I want to just go on to something else. Our new devotionals are in, so if you read these, some of you will pick one up and give them to someone. I think we mail, I don't know how many we mail out every month. Um, if you would, you can go ahead and pick one of those up, and that begins, um, this one will begin in December, uh, so make sure you pick one up on your way out. Um, Pastor and Noah are in, let's see, where are they? Waynesboro. I can't keep up. I really can't. Um, Waynesboro, Mississippi, uh, they're doing a meeting there. The pastor at that church was actually the first pastor that ever asked my husband to minister in Mississippi. And so it, that is a long-time relationship. Eddie Bean, you may know him, Beverly. Uh, that's who they're preaching a revival for, and God is doing phenomenal things there. Uh, they also did um, a service today. Some of you may have picked that up. It's a service that Noah is doing every other Wednesday at 12 o'clock. I think he does them. And uh, him and my husband did it today. And it just, I sat and watched that, and it just blessed my heart to see God using them together. And it's a phenomenal thing. I mean, some people say, I have never heard of team preaching, especially father and son team preaching. Uh, and honestly, you have to have an anointing to do that. Uh, and a, a special kind of anointing, and God has bestowed that on both of them, and people are requesting them and wanting them to come together for team ministry, and I just thank the Lord for every open door and every opportunity, and the wonderful thing is that even though Pastor is not here tonight, we can still receive from him, so he has a word for us on screen in just a few moments, um, but before we go there, I want to give you an opportunity to prosper tonight. And um, we're going to worship the Lord in our giving. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus, that I have an opportunity to give. Amen. I want to remind all of us this evening that God will never ask us for anything we don't have. He'll never ask you for anything that you don't have. One time, uh, the disciples come to Jesus, and they're asking, how are we going to feed all these people? All the 5,000 people. Five, it says 5,000 men, so there's no telling how many thousands when you add on the wives and the children were there, and he had been ministering and teaching them. And the disciples came to him and said, Lord, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus said, what do you have? I want you to say it out loud. What do you have? And they said, well, this little boy's got five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring it to me. And he takes it and he feeds thousands of people. Another time, Moses said to God, Lord, I can't go before Pharaoh. I can't even speak. I, I can relate to that so much because there was a time in my life that to stand up and minister, to stand up and just greet a congregation, would it would terrify me. Sheila, I felt nauseous when I knew that we were about to start a new revival and my husband was going to ask me to stand up and greet the people because I was so insecure. And so I could, and all of my words got tangled. I remember the first time I did a marriage conference with him, my first words out of my mouth when it was my session was, it is so good to be with Brother Sheila and Sister Charlie. 
And everybody in the house did what you're doing right now. And do you know I didn't even realize what I'd said? And after service, they told me. But I was so nervous. I couldn't get my words out. It, I was just so um, insecure in who I was. So I could relate to Moses. Moses said, I can't go before Pharaoh. I stutter when I talk. I'm uneducated. And God asked him, what do you have, Moses? And Moses said, I've got a staff. I've got a stick. And God said, well, throw it down. Give it to me. And God used it. What did David have? David had a sling. And God used it to take down Goliath and to make him a king. God will never ask you for what you don't have, but he will ask you for what you have. And when you choose to be obedient and you release what you have, he releases something even greater. I believe God is always asking us, what do you have? What's in your hand? And when we give God what's in our hand, he releases what's in his hand. Do you hear what I'm saying tonight? Do you receive that tonight? Do you believe that? When we sow, we set ourselves up, Theresa, for God to bless our lives. It's amazing what he can do when we're obedient in this area of our lives. Sister Regina, I, I don't ever seem to make ends meet. The first question I have is, are you a tither? Do you give to the kingdom? And if you say no, I tell you, that is exactly why you have the issues that you have. Regina, Sister Regina, I don't have anything to give. Start with a prayer request on a piece of paper. God, I don't have a dime to my name, but I'm asking you to give me seed to sow. And when you pray and ask God to give you seed to sow, not seed to strow, seed to sow, God will give seed to the sower according to his word. Amen? Do you receive that? We've got ushers. Uh, if you need a giving envelope, slip up your hand. If you tithe on Wednesday nights, I ask you to prepare that. And we're going to give to God what he said was his. And then we're going to purpose in our heart what we're going to give as an offering. Amen? And uh, there are so many different ways that you can give. If you give online through text giving, through the church app, all of that information uh, is up there for you. And I just want to say thank you for your obedience. Do you know every need of this church is always met? I just want you to think about that a minute. Just look around. Just look around. And now look at me. Every need for this house is always supplied. God always makes a way. And God uses faithful people just like you. And I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, for your church. How many of you love your church? I just want to thank you for loving your church enough to support it and be faithful to it. Amen. Have I told you tonight that I love you? If I haven't, I just want to say I love you. I love every single one of you. Uh, you are my brothers and my sisters, and I hope you don't just hear that. I hope you feel it because I really, really do love you. Amen. You got your seed in your hand. If you tithe on Wednesday nights, you got your tithe in your hand. Father, we thank you that we have seed to sow. We thank you for the revelation of tithing. I thank you that I have an understanding that it's not a, regu a regulation, but it's a revelation of giving back to you what you said belongs to you. You always keep a portion for yourself. And anyone that studies the word of God sees that you always hold back a portion for yourself. And when it comes to our finances, you said 10% is mine. That belongs to me. And when you give it to me, when you're obedient to give it to me, I will bless the 90%. So, Father, I thank you for that revelation. 
And I thank you for every person in this house that as they're obedient in this area, that every need in their life is supplied. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise for that. And everybody said, amen. You can give now. And they're supposed to be giving music, but that's okay. <laughs> you can just hum your way back to your seat. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much. And for those of you that are faithful um, online that sow into this house, I want to say thank you for that. Are you ready for the word? I think we're running about five minutes ahead of schedule. I wish you could see the itinerary that my husband sent me, the order of service. At 7.08, you're supposed to be doing this. At, at 7.15, and, and <laughs> I looked, I said, 7.08? Okay, so we'll, we'll, try, we'll try that. And, of course, he wouldn't care if the Holy Spirit just took the service and, and we didn't even show his teaching. You know that if you know him. Uh, but there's always preparation, amen, and we strive for excellence, and, and we just thank God for, for that. How many of you appreciate your pastor? I love him. I love him so much, and I miss him. Can y'all tell I miss him, my baby? He'll be home tonight. Your baby will be home tonight. Anyway, I'm going to sit down, and is it ready? Okay, you guys... Um, just open up your spirits and receive from Pastor tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm so glad that you made it to midweek tonight. You were intentional about it. You will not regret having done the right thing when you stand before Jesus. I believe nobody's going to feel good if they stand before Jesus having done all the wrong things. So thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you for entering into praise and worship and realizing that we must always praise and worship to the audience of one. And uh, thank you for adding your amen, which means you're so be it, on to what's happening here. Not only thinking about your personal development, but thinking about your uh, being here, your attendance, your activity, your participation, how that it affects others as well. Sometimes people forget that not only does your participation above all help you, but it really makes an impact on others as well. Because there's something about going forward together that's huge. We know we preach Sunday on closing the deal and what it, what it means to not just start something, but to Go all the way through and finish strongly. To finish it for the glory of God. To finish it in the authority of Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go into some addition to that. A different message title and really a, even a little different focus. But how do you finish strongly? How do you endure? I want to speak tonight about enduring power enduring power. Matter of fact, everyone confess those two words with me, please. Enduring power. Before I read a verse of scripture to you, don't miss Sunday. Invite, invite, invite. Be a bringer. Reach out to unsaved people, not people from another church, but unsaved people, people that are backslidden, that are out of church, that have no relationship with God, that if they died, they'd go to hell. Or if the rapture took place, they would be left behind. If I say it like that, maybe it puts a little more emphasis on it. Maybe it bothers us a little bit more. Let's be reaching out. It's my responsibility. It's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. Let's, let's, let's reach as much as we can. We can't save people, but we are commissioned to tell them. And thank you so much for your part. Let's see this place get more and more full. Let's believe God for much. In the book of Matthew chapter 24, say it again, enduring power. Matthew 24 verse 13. I'm going to use this verse, then I'm going to take you to a text with context in it that has strong emphasis. Jesus said, when describing the end times, when referencing what things would be like near the catching away of the saints, uh, near the beginning of the great tribulation period, near the 
process through even some of the great tribulation period and near the second coming or the return of Jesus with his saints at the end of things before the millennial, the millennial reign of Christ begins, he makes this statement in verse 13. But he, meaning people kind, not just men, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now think about that verse. Who said it? Not just an upstart preacher who's trying to learn how to put material together and preach a good sermon. No, and and thank God for those who are trying, who are called and are trying to grow. But no, it was Jesus our Christ. He said, he, those individuals who claim to be my followers, that endure unto the end, shall be saved. Now, that messes up a lot of people's theologies, that people that say, I'm saved, I'm always saved. Once you get saved, you're always saved, and that's it. Well, I believe, and once you get saved, you ought to live saved, and there's no need to be anything that's unsaved. But if we do not finish to the end, then what we call our salvation is not going to be adequate. Real Bible salvation is not just something you receive and then your life never changes. And I would say most people agree with that, even people who teach or have the mindset. I'm not so sure if it's always taught or just the mindset of it for people who want to abuse grace rather than appreciate grace. Even people who say they believe in unconditional eternal security would believe that if you don't live like a saved person, then how can you really be saved? Well, anyhow you want to look at that. The thing is, let's get saved if we're not saved. If we've been forgiven of our sins, let's live saved because we're not just saved, we're being saved if we trust what the Scripture says. And I'm going to tell you something. I trust Jesus more than I do other people's theories. And he said, he or she or those or they who endure, in other words, who finish, who live this thing, not by the strength of flesh, but by the grace of God and by the guidance of Scripture to the end shall be saved. Well, that means their lives. Yes, it does, doesn't it? It means their everything. It means our everything. Everyone say enduring power. There is so much to be said about the unique workings of the Holy Ghost. I want to say that again. There's so much that we could say that we need to say because the workings of the Holy Spirit will cover every part of our lives if we don't deny him and quench him. So much to be said about his unique workings. And we need all the blessings. Would you say all? I like that word when it's working in my favor, don't you? Because all means all. That's all it's ever going to mean. All means all. It means all. We need all the blessings and workings of Holy Spirit that are available. And I think every one of us would agree with that. But upon agreeing with it, we must make the decision that we don't waste our agreement by just saying, I nod my head and agree, but I'm not going to give place to it. No, we need to be giving place and growing in what he makes available because they're not just options. They're not just, oh, that's a nicer car. That's a lesser car. Oh, that's a nicer life. That's a lesser life. No, this is, this is the kind of life that we're all called to pursue. We need all the blessings, all the workings of the Holy Spirit. Notice, perseverance, great, great godly man who uh, greatly used in previous generations, uh, the previous generation said, perseverance is more than endurance. It is endurance combined with absolute assurance and certainty that we are looking for, or that what we are looking for is going to happen. Let me say it again. It was the great Oswald Chambers that made this statement, I believe, under an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Perseverance is more than endurance. It is endurance combined with the absolute assurance and certainty that we are looking for and that what we are looking for is going to happen. If we are looking for the things God wants us to look for, they're going to happen. If we will use our faith and look for the things that God lets us know he's capable of doing. If we use our faith, it's going to happen. So perseverance is more than endurance. It is endurance 
combined with absolute assurance. So what we need is perseverance and we need endurance because together they cause us to see happen what God wants to happen or what God's capable of making happening. That's good. William Barclay, great man of God, said, endurance is not just the ability to bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory. That's good. To not just bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory. To not just make it through the night, but to light up the darkness. To not just go through a sickness, but to come out on the other side, healed, healthy, and whole, and victorious. To not just go through a storm, but to go through that storm with a testimony. To not just go through a tragedy, but to come out of that tragedy in triumph. And that trial with a testimony. Are you hearing me? Endurance is the ability to not just bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory. George Mueller said, to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. I've learned my faith by standing firm amid severe testings, said Brother Mueller. Watchman Nee, a great writer, gospel kingdom man, said everyone who believes in God must have His revelation, notice not personal, but his revelation in his, the person who believes spirit, or else what he or she or they believe is not God, but mere human wisdom, ideals, or words. Such faith, human wisdom, human ideals, and words, that kind of faith cannot endure the test. That kind of faith does not give place to enduring power because the power of the Holy Spirit in this capacity comes to give us the ability to live this out, to walk this out, to flesh this out, and to get stronger. God never promised to cakewalk, but he promised to walk alongside us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you, even until the end of the age. We always have him near, so why would we act like he's so far away? I think the problem is our hearts have drifted many times, and so we feel ashamed to even claim scriptures like that other than just say them in some comfortable, you know, make me feel better about things kind of way of thinking. No, I don't want to just feel better about things. I want us to be better. One great person said, a great man of God said, I care not where I go or how I live, meaning the circumstances, or what I endure so that I may save souls. When I sleep, I dream of them. When I awake, they are first in my thoughts. My prayer is that as believers, we get to a place that we think about people's unsaved lives around us, that we can look beyond their fault and see their need, that we become aware that God anoints our eyes with heaven's eye salve and just melt anything calloused about us and let some tears flow. Let some compassion move us because the realities are many of the things we're enduring have to do with issues of other people that are on their way to hell. And maybe the reason why Christ has allowed us to be part of their lives and trusted us with that moment is that we might turn the light on in the midst of their darkness. I'm teaching in this room today. A great old preacher said, to endure the cross is not tragedy. It is suffering, which is the fruit of an exclusive allegiance to Jesus Christ. Nobody in their right mind likes suffering. Nobody in their right mind really wants to suffer. But the scripture is clear. If we're willing to suffer with him and for his cause, meaning the cause of Jesus, we will reign with him. And that the suffering we go through is but for a little while in comparison to the big picture of eternity. Going through something that's difficult 
Being able to endure it. Now, how do you endure it? I don't see how in the arm of the flesh. I don't see how with mere religion. I don't see how anybody could with a backslidden heart, but a heart that's cleansed and, and, and regularly staying neath the drippings of the blood of Jesus and operating in the fullness of the power of the Holy Ghost. This is the power to endure. But along with that anointing and that ableness is instruction. And it's so important that you get that in your spirit, that to endure the cross is not tragedy. Jesus endured the cross, Hebrews said, despising the shame. And for the joy set before him, our redemption, mine and your deliverance, mine and your salvation, he endured all that because he, he, he believed we were worth it. He suffered for us that we might not suffer damnation. So any kind of suffering we suffer for him, it's not a tragedy. It is a triumph. Woo, hallelujah. It is a triumph, and it is a depiction that you are not just a Christ follower in name only, but that you're a follower in pursuit, and the proof of our desire is in our pursuit, and who and what we're pursuing for real, for real is really who we are. Are you following Jesus? My dad sang that song. I, I heard Jimmy Swaggart sing it years ago, and when I heard it, my mind went to my dad. And so I had to sing it too. It says, the pathway seems narrow as he leads me on. Why? Well, because Jesus said narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Few there be that find it, I believe, because... When it gets right down to it, few are looking for the path that Jesus says is best. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go that way. I walk in his shadow, the next line. My fears are all gone. Maybe the reason people are operating in such levels of fear is they're not abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Like Psalm 91 provision gives us. My spirit grows stronger. How? Abiding under the shadow. Each moment, each day. In other words, he's not just a Sunday, Wednesday fix. Or oh, man, let's let's get let's get more real with this modern church culture. About a, every other third, fourth Sunday fix, like the more American church has become. My spirit grows stronger each moment, each day. I'm following Jesus. Oh my God, now he's about to get with he's about to get up in our business. Each step of the way. You show me the air you're not following Jesus in, and I will show you either your present failure or your coming collapse. I'm following Jesus one step at a time. This is victory. This is how you overcome. I live for the moment in his love divine. That's how every one of us felt when we first came to him. And that's how we should feel that much more in this hour because we should be closer to him than when we first came to him. I am teaching better than you're letting on. My spirit grows stronger each moment, each day. I'm following Jesus each step of the way. Now listen, integrity is built by defeating the temptation to be dishonest. Humility grows when we refuse to be prideful. And endurance develops Every time you reject the temptation to give up. I'm going to say that one more time. Then I need to show you something in Acts chapter 4. Integrity. Would you say that word with me? Come on. It's a, it's a beautiful word. It's a blessed word. It's a kingdom word. It's a word that should matter to you about your life. Integrity is built by defeating the temptation to be dishonest. Humility grows. When we refuse to be prideful, if you choose to be prideful, you are not humble, period. And endurance develops every time you reject the temptation. And it is a temptation because you were not born to quit if you're born again. You were born to win, but just because you're born to win doesn't make you a winner. You must choose to be what you were born to be. You must live what you were born into. You have been born again, so you cannot live like the old dead you. 
When you reject the temptation to give up, that's where endurance develops. <laughs> we'll not quit. We'll not stop. We'll grow. We'll become. We'll increase. Won't just tread water. Won't just barely pucker my lips and barely get them above water so that I can breathe. We'll grow through this. If I'm going to go through this, I'm going to grow through this because the power of the Holy Ghost isn't some little squeaky mouse power with no voice. The power of the Holy Spirit is the greatest power power that has ever touched this people planet and that power enables us to endure and in our endurance we're not just barely making it we're getting stronger because as endurance increases strength increases got to see this in the positive side if you're that half glass empty rather than a half glass full person you're going to think endurance has helped me make it to the finish line but if you're the half glass at least half full person you're going to realize not only am I going to make it to the finish line but I'm getting stronger through my pursuit no matter what I go through I'm growing through would you shout amen raise your hands in this place magnify him and glorify him I know if you moments ago you got tempted to run to the bathroom and act like your kidneys were active but but you stayed you stayed in the moment and if you just got back don't you feel funny now hallelujah and if you really had to go don't get condemned but if you ran for the wrong reason just feel convicted praise God let's praise the Lord for a moment because of enduring power and what he's able to do and how he's able to grow us up and to raise us up man I'm not going back backsliding is not our call we're going we got so much to go forward to we have so much to look forward to and how can you be looking forward to heaven but your life is going back? No, if you're looking forward to heaven, prove it by your pursuit in going forward toward him. Now, Acts chapter 4, please look with me. Acts chapter 4, and you are welcome, 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 because I know you're enjoying this. I smell a little bit of hide burning even through this video, but some of you are really getting blessed by this. The only ones who hate it are the ones I've done everything but called your name. But I'm not really thinking about a face. I'm just thinking about obeying God. And it's his job to call us up. But sometimes to call people up, you got to call them out. And God will do that because he's just good like that. He's just nice like that. He's just not going to let people claim his identity and not be dealt with to really be like him. Amen. And I know this much. I'm, I, I got so much room to grow. But the more Christ-like I become, the better my life becomes. Would you turn to the person beside you and say, you know, the more Christ-like my life becomes, the better my life becomes. Now, Acts chapter 4, so much is happening. Uh, I'm going to glean some things. I want to zero in on verses, uh, maybe about the midway of the chapter. But the Passion Translation shares so many great things that shows us the operation, the activity of the early church flowing in enduring power. It wasn't just... Uh, they are Pentecost in long scale time before they had another move of God. No, they got a move of God and they chose to live in and grow in and flow in and give place to a life of a move of God. This is how it started. This is how it should continue. Acts 4 verse 1, the teaching and preaching Peter and John had, had done, had angered the priests. What happened? Well, at the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3, Jesus had raised up, excuse me, Jesus, yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of Peter and John, there we go, raised up a man at the beautiful gate with this ugly problem. He's been there a long time. I mean, his whole life he's been lame. And they began to preach and people began to be saved. At least 5,000 people wind up, that, excuse me, I said that wrongly, 5,000 men, because that's the way this particular culture counted the crowd. That's 5,000 men. So there were way more. There were thousands of people that came to the Lord because women and children were believing on the Lord too. So this preaching that Peter and John are doing is lifting Jesus high. And the religious people hate it because they are anti-Jesus people. Now, it says, this angered the priest, the captain of the temple police, the representatives of the Jewish sect 
the group called the Sadducees. They were furious that the people were being taught that in Jesus, there is a resurrection from the dead. Matter of fact, Jesus is the resurrection. Let me just put the emphasis on it right there. Or the emphasis. Amen. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the life. And those that come to him shall not die a spiritual death, but they shall live. And everybody in this room that's alive in Christ would just shout yes. Now, 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 let's go a little further. They arrested them. Talking about Peter and John. It was already evening. They kept them in custody. <coughs> Pardon me, till the next day. Yet there were many in the crowd who had believed the message. Bringing the total of men to nearly 5,000. Just told you that. Verse 5. The next day, many Jewish leaders, religious scholars, and elders of the people convened a meeting in Jerusalem. This is all given in account in Acts chapter 4. Annas, the high priest, was there with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others who were members of the high priest's family. And they made Peter and John stand in front of them of this council, and they questioned them, saying, Tell us, by what power and authority have you done these things? Boy, did they ask the right people the right question. Now, for them, it was the wrong people the wrong question. But it should have been the right people, the right question, because Peter is unequivocally clear. He says, fill with the Holy Spirit. Notice that. Say enduring power. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered, respected elders and leaders of the people. Listen, are we being put on trial today for doing an act of kindness by healing a frail, crippled man? Well, that'd make you feel stupid if you were fighting that, wouldn't it? No, ain't enough religion in the world to argue that point. But somehow or another, religious people will find a way to argue even when truth is exposed, their error and their heresy and their foolishness. Well then, Peter says, you and everyone else in Israel should know that it is by the power of the name of Jesus that this crippled man stands here today completely healed. Oh, hallelujah. You crucified Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Boy, that stung because they knew they did. They thought they killed him, but they didn't kill him. They just sowed him. Woo! They didn't kill him. They didn't stop him. They just sowed him. They S-O-W-E-D'd him. Why? Because, why? Because he just reproduces after his kind. The father wanted a harvest, so he sowed his son, Jesus. And Jesus came and lived and preached and taught and fulfilled and finished everything. Then he died, graveyard dead on a cross, entered into the lower parts of the earth. He came forth on resurrection morning. And when he came out of the tomb, everybody who will ever believe on him and receive him, your salvation walked out of that tomb with him. Shout yes, hallelujah. I am preaching, teaching right now. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. You crucified him. Y'all did it. But God raised him from the dead. Verse 11. This Jesus is the stone. You, the builders, you folk have rejected, and now he has become the cornerstone, the one who makes sure that the foundation is perfect. Without him in that position or without the foundation and the corner being set up perfect, nothing can be on point. Everything will be off, but he is the chief cornerstone. One translation says, verse 12, there is no one else who has the power, preach, Pete, preach, to save us, for there is only one name to whom God has given authority by which we must experience salvation. That is the name of Jesus. Would everyone in this room right now raise your hand straight up and just worship Jesus with me for a moment. Come on, bless him. Raise your hands up. Raise your hands up. Some of it was slow to do it. Keep your hands up longer. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Magnify him, the Savior of the world, the one who walked into your life of darkness and turned the light on. And if you have followed him, is not only your Savior, your Redeemer, but he is the Lord of your life and he is the source of your life. He's the everything in your life. 
Verse 13, the council members were astonished as they witnessed the bold courage of Peter and John, especially when they discovered that they were ordinary men who had never had religious training, but they weren't uneducated. They might have been uneducated in the sense that they did not have a formal cultural worldly education or even a church education that can be a good thing if you use it for the right purpose. Because it's important to understand your history. It's important to learn properly. But you can't call these guys untrained totally because they've been with Jesus. They've learned from Jesus. And yet you don't get a greater teacher. You don't get a greater example. You don't get a greater influence than Jesus. Verse 13 goes on to say, then they began to understand that the effect Jesus had on them simply by spending time with him. That is so powerful. Verse 13, Acts 4, the Passion Translation, that final phrase. These religious, frustrated people understood the effect Jesus had on the disciples by spending time with him. If I can get you as believers to for real live a life that spends time with Jesus in prayer, in the Word, and in the Holy Ghost, you will endure. You will grow and you will become. You cannot fall away like that. You will only become a world changer and a difference maker. If you're falling away, it is because you do not spend any time with Jesus. I don't believe you can backslide if you spend some time with him. I believe if you fall away, it's because you're just saying you have something you do not pursue. Verse 14, standing there with them, the man who was healed, there was nothing further they could say. The proof was in the pudding. <laughs> Verse 15, they ordered them to leave the room while they discussed the matter. And among themselves, they began to say, what should we do with these men? Everyone in Jerusalem can clearly see that they performed a notable sign and wonder. And we can't deny that. Verse 17, but to keep this propaganda, boy, it's amazing the stupidity of religious people that just want to fight God. I've been going 30 minutes, but guess what? I'm going to go just, just a little bit more before I stop. Not much longer, but a little bit more. They called it propaganda. No, it was reality of the gospel being demonstrated. Hey, cessationists and religious people will find a way to try to tear this down. But you will face God over that, you, you crazy person. You, I started to say fool, but I'm going to be nice. You crazy person, you will face God on that. You want to call it propaganda? You want to call it something that doesn't happen? You'll face God on that. But Peter knew what he had seen, and he knew what happened when he invoked the name of Jesus. Praise be unto God. I'm thinking of an atheist right now. He, he was cussing and swearing when he went down to the altar because the Holy Ghost was convicting him. When he got to the altar, he said, if you really are real, the power of God put him on the floor. He began to realize who, that, that God was real, and he cried out to God for mercy and grace and forgiveness, and they cast demons out of him. Atheist. Cast demons out of him, set him free. He got up out of that altar radically saved, wanting to grow and wanting to learn, and has become a radical end time evangelist from atheism to radical Jesusism. Transformation. They can call it propaganda, but it's not. It's truth. Well, verse 18 they brought them back to the council and they commanded them, Don't you ever? Or you better never preach to the people or speak again using the name of Jesus. But Peter looked him in the eye before they dismissed him. And, and John, both these guys speaking up together, you can judge for yourselves, is it better to listen to God or you? To you or God? It's impossible for us to stop speaking. Why? Because when you know the truth, when you're intimately acquainted with the truth, when you have been transformed by the truth, there is no more being unplugged. There's no more quiet. It's impossible for us to stop speaking about all the things we have seen Jesus do. 
and we have heard about the goodness of God. Verse 21, since the members of the council couldn't come up with a crime, they could punish them for. (laughs) Crazy religious people. They threatened them once more and let them go. All the people, notice, all the people praised God, thrilled over the miraculous healing of the crippled man. Only people that weren't the praising God at this point now are the religious fault finders. Everybody else seems that's in the atmosphere is praising God, thrilled for what happened for the man, celebrating what God had done. Verse 22, and the man who received the miracle sign of healing was over 40 years old. Now, there's some great significance. I got to show you something. Can I just show you one more thing just because I love you? In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, after the sufferings of the cross, Jesus appeared alive many times to these same apostles over a 40-day period. Now, notice. I want to show you something powerful about this 40 days. That man was over 40 years of age. The number 40 is significant for it speaks of transformation, transformation and completeness through testing. Jesus was tempted for 40 days. The deluge during Noah's days lasted 40 days and nights. Moses met with God for 40 days on Mount Sinai. Israel wandered for 40 years, and Elijah fasted for 40 days. Jesus spent 40 days appearing to his disciples to teach them that a day of completeness and transformation has arrived. It took them 40 days to comprehend that Christ's kingdom was spiritual, not political. Wow. Listen now as I close. Verse 23. As soon as they were released from custody, Peter and John went to the believers. Uh, You go, leaders. And explained. Didn't go to the doubters. He went to the believers. And explained all that had happened with the high priest and the elders. When the believers heard their report, they raised their voices in unity. One voice. And prayed, Lord Yahweh, meaning the Lord is one. You are the Lord of all. You created the universe, the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything that is in them. And you spoke by the Holy Spirit through your servant David, our forefathers, saying, How dare the nations plant a rebellion, ranting and raging against the Lord Most High. Their foolish plots are futile. Look at how the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers scheming and conspiring against God and his anointed Messiah, which of course is Jesus. In fact, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Jews and non-Jews, met together to take their stand against your holy servant, Jesus the Messiah. They did that to him all that for the purpose of, to minimize him according to the destiny that you had marked out for him. Look at verse 29 and 30 and 31, and I'm done. Oh, that rhymed. So now, Lord, I almost beatbox, but I was able to withstand the temptation. Yeah, I'm growing, I think, or maybe I just, I'm out of time. Now, Lord, listen to their threats to harm us. Empower us as your servants to speak the word of God freely and courageously. Stretch out your hand of power. In other words, do more, God. Do more, God. We will endure. We will overcome. Thank you for your power. Stretch out your hand of power through us to heal. Through us, not for us, but through us. Use us. Don't just show us stuff, but use us. And to move in signs and wonders. Do it through us, Lord, by the name of your holy son, Jesus. And as they prayed, the earth shook beneath them. God's power, enduring power, shook the place. An earthquake proportion move of God, causing the building there to tremble. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, They either got filled initially, but most of them got a refilling. 
because we refill, we refuel to release. Hallelujah. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit and they proclaimed the word of God with unrestrained boldness. Unrestrained boldness. This involves more than confidence. It was a free-flowing, unrestrained boldness. It can also mean freedom of speech. Parousia is the Greek word. It carries nuances that are not easily brought into English. The person who speaks with parousia will see will say, rather, everything that is on his mind that's, that God puts on their mind, please understand, with no restraint, flowing out of his heart with confidence. It involves being frank and honest, hiding nothing, and speaking directly to the heart. Most often, it is a word used for public speaking. It refers to speech that is not tailored to make everyone happy, but to speak the truth in spite of what it may cost. It is the courage to speak truth into the ears of others. This was reserved for only the highest rank of leaders. But I'm telling you, it don't get no higher rank than when God's anointing moves on you, through you, and then gives you the bold, enduring power to continue on the kingdom legacy. Would you raise your hands, everybody? I've gone probably, I don't know. I've gone, I'm, I'm less than 40 minutes to team. I'm less than 40 minutes, but <clears throat> you could have took about an hour and a half of this. I'm just trying to be nice. And we have a lot of things to do, even in this setting I'm in right now. But I extend my hands towards you. I'm about to bring Regina back up here. She may incorporate other leaders to minister and, and pray for people. But Holy Spirit, I thank you for speaking by your word. I thank you for raising us up and growing us up. I thank you, dear God, for just turning the stones over, leaving nothing unturned that needs to be unturned, working wonderfully, and revealing your goodness, providing your help and your breakthrough and grace in our lives. Lord, I thank you, dear Lord, for the anointing on this service for the impact that it's making. I wished it would change everybody, but to the ones who want it, I thank you that they are the recipients of something awesome straight from you in the glorious name of Jesus. In this moment, in this moment right now, Regina, just come, sweetheart, and just flow, incorporate it, whatever you need to incorporate. Just be led by the Holy Spirit. I love you all. I'll see you Sunday right now. Just stay in the flow of the moment. opportunity for all of us that are in this for the long haul to be strengthened in our faith no matter what we're going through knowing that we can endure until the end that no matter what's facing me right now I can see the light on the other side of it because I'm not giving up I'm not going back I'm not slowing down. I'm in it for the long haul. How many of you received that tonight? And this is what this is how I want to end this service. And my husband may have shared this scripture or he may have just referred to it. But it's one that I go back to quite often. Um, in Hebrews 12, no one really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um the information that is before the book of Hebrews in my Bible says only God really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. But whoever wrote it said this in verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so, gra so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. You want to endure until the end? Don't get heavy laden. Don't get burdened down with the cares of this world. Learn how to cast them. 
Amen. Learn how to give them to God. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance. Somebody shout, I'm going to run with endurance. The race that is set before us. And whoever wrote the book of Hebrews then went on in the next verse, I believe, to tell me how I could do that. How I could run my race and finish strong, Roseanne. Looking unto Jesus. Keeping my eyes focused on Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul said at the very end of his race, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my race. And I kept the faith. I want that to be my testimony when I come to the end of this thing. If the rapture doesn't take place and I come to the end of this thing, I want to be able to say, I finished strong. And while I'm running my race, my husband said something that just went off in me. I've heard him say it before, but it went off in my spirit and somebody needs to hear it again. While I'm running my race, I want the proof of my love for him not to be in what I say, but to be in my pursuit of him. The proof of my love for him is in my pursuit of him. How awesome is that? And that goes for everybody. The proof of your love for Him is in your pursuit of Him. You're not pursuing Him, that tells the story. You pursue Him a little bit, that tells the story. If you're in full pursuit of Him, that tells the story. Amen? Tells the story of your life. My husband preached a message one time, and he had somebody build a, it was a, made out of styrofoam, and it was a tombstone and it had his birth date on it his name on it and the dash and that was it and he preached on the dash that whole service I come into this world and this is when I leave this world but what did I do during the dash we have an opportunity to pursue Him like never before. And that's what I pray for everyone in this place tonight, that you leave here more determined to pursue Him. Somebody shout out loud, I'm not giving up. Somebody shout louder, I'm getting stronger. I'm pursuing Him. Nothing is stopping me in my pursuit of Him. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close the service out this way. You're dismissed to go, but if you need prayer, uh, I'm here, and I'll have somebody with me that, that can agree. We'll get together and we'll pray for you, so you just come on up, and we'll dismiss. I want you to remember what is Sunday. Friends and Family Day. Invite somebody to church Sunday. And we're just going to believe God for a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Amen. And also our fast begins Friday. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday for those of you that are fasting the first three days of the month. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. I look forward to seeing you soon.